Exodus chapter 6, we are continuing the portion of Moses and his prayer life. All right. And before we begin tonight, let's go ahead and ask the Lord's blessing on our Bible study. Dearly Father, we thank you so much for giving us this time together that we have. Father, we thank you for your, your wonderful word. We know that your word is the words of life. We know that every good thing cometh from above. and You have given it to us as your wisdom, which is better than rubies. Help us to esteem your word higher and higher. and Help it to motivate us. Help it to show us what to do and how to do it. And Father, may you give us uh, encouragement tonight uh, with our prayer lives. We can always do uh, better in our prayer life. We thank you for the ability to pray. And we thank you for the example of Moses. And all the, the ins and outs of him. And uh, we praise you that you are able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Right now we are in the midst of a problem for Moses. If you remember last time, we were in the midst of this, this trial that is, Moses is going through. Uh, just to give you a, a review about what we talked about last time. Moses was assigned by God to go to the people and announce, The Lord knows your problems. The know, Lord knows your affliction. And He is going to deliver you out of those afflictions. Boy, everybody around must have said, Yes, praise the Lord. And they started worshiping God. And so, then Moses came before Pharaoh with his brother Aaron, and they said, Thus saith the Lord, and of course you get the picture of Charlton Heston in your head if you're familiar with Ten Commandments, uh, let my people go. And uh, Pharaoh had a unique uh, way of saying no. He asked the question, Who is the Lord that I should obey him? And we talked about how an amazing thing it is that a shepherd went before the Pharaoh, the king of the known world, and basically demanding that the, all of the slaves, all the uh, workforce of the Egyptians to go free to worship the Lord. Yeah, what kind of uh, a serious response would that be? <laughs> Who's the Lord that I'm going to obey him? No way. And if you remember, there was consequences to Moses saying that. Uh, instead of now the Egyptians used to supply the straw for the bricks, which we talked about last time. The bricks needed straw in order to be a binding agent. Now they are doing double duty. Instead of uh, mixing the bricks and mixing the straw right there at their work site, now they have to go gather what's left after a harvest, gather the straw, what they can find, the stubble, as it said, and then do the same amount of work. They said it's because they are lazy, because they are idle, that uh, they are wanting their, their freedom. And so, because of that, the people turned on Moses, and then Moses came back to God and said, God, th there's a problem. <laughs> and in fact, in verse uh, let's see, in, in verse number 23 and 20, 22 and 23 of last chapter, he, he finishes off with saying in verse 22, Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so evil entreated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he, has, he hath done evil to this people, neither hath thou delivered thy people at all. And so he's going through a rough time right now of, well, that didn't work. Now, true enough, if you remember what God had told him originally, he told him that it's not going to work. He says, you, you know, you're going to tell Pharaoh this, and he's not going to listen to you. And it's not by a, a strong hand that I will deliver my people out of Egypt. But I think here he is, well, you know, kind of thunderstruck a little bit. He's thinking, well, this should be easy. God's on my side. I went and did exactly what he told me to do. And, okay, this is not a victory on my, my end here. It's more of a defeat. 
But understand that God has much more in store for Egypt than, than uh, Moses ever realized. Paul. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and it's an interesting thought too because on one hand, beforehand, Moses thought he was the guy to lead his people out of Egypt when he was younger, and so he killed the Egyptian thinking that would spur on, hey, this is the guy. This is the guy that God's going to use in getting us out of here, which is true, but not at that point in time. And then that same point Day after, okay, are you going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian? Okay, now we, okay, God's going to deliver you. Okay, Pharaoh, let my people go. No? Okay, you made things worse. Now the people have turned on you once again. Oh, oh, oh dear. So no wonder Moses is a little discouraged here. Um, so God is going to tell him and encourage him. We, we've been through verses 1 through, I want to say verse number 5. And so we're just going to read through that um, Real quick to remind ourselves where we're at. Verse number one of chapter six. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go. And with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham and unto Isaac and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groanings of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. So remember he is going back to, okay, what, does the, what is the word of God back when Abraham was around, and Isaac, and Jacob. And God gave them the specific promises <clears throat> that hasn't happened yet. You think about, God says to him, I'm going to make you a great nation, Abraham. Well, he had, well, Ishmael, which I read today in my devotions. Uh, <laughs> and I love Ishmael's story just because it's Hagar. You wouldn't think that Hagar was anybody in God's eyes. But when she ran away, the angel Lord appeared to her and said, where are you doing? Where are you going? Well, my, 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 my mistress, my, my master, is treating me harshly. No, no. Go back. Submit yourself to her. Don't worry. You are with child, and you shall have a son, and you shall name him Ishmael. Because the Lord has seen you. The Lord knows all about what you're going through. And he, it's funny, he's going to be a wild man. <laughs> just, okay, is that a good thing? Well, that's just the matter of fact, that's who he is. He's going to be a wild man and he's going to have a, a nation. He's going to have kings coming out of, out of him and all of that. You know, a nobody of Hagar, a slave, God still knows all about her and, she, and he cares for her. I love that story. Um, but yeah, Abraham has Ishmael, then he has Isaac, and then a few other kids after that point. Uh, but yet, none of them are a nation. Well, he dies off. Isaac has Jacob and Esau. Those two are supposed to be nations, but in, in Isaac's own lifetime, they don't become a nation. Now, Jacob becomes a big family, that's true. But then he dies off, then Jacob has a big family. They go to Egypt all together, well... Joseph first, and then everybody else later. And there, well, he dies, and it's not quite a nation. It's a lot of their family. But while in Egypt, he become, they become a big family, a big nation. It is, it is established to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob beforehand, and God has yet to achieve the promises that he has promised them specifically. So, Israel has never, at this point in time, occupied the land of the promised land. But yet, God promised. And so we see that I have promised, I established my covenant, and to give them the land of Canaan. And they were strangers. They didn't receive what I promised them, but yet, these people will. And so here, I love what it says. Verse number 6 is where we're going to pick up now. And what does Moses? what is Moses going to say to the people that have disowned him. Notice with me in verse 6. 
Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments, and I will take you for, to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will bring you in, in unto the land concerning which I swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it to you for an heritage. I am the Lord. There is a lot there to unpack. Anyway, uh, let, let's ask the question, what um, in this proclamation is wonderful if you were in the same state as that of Israel itself? If you were in Israel's shoes, you're a, a, a slave in Egypt, what would be really good news from, from what he just said? Millie? You're going to be free from bondage. Yeah, Absolutely. <laughs> Once again, they heard that before too. So, yeah. Anybody else? What? What? From what God just said to them to encourage them in His own word would be very exciting if you were a slave in Egypt. Yes. Yeah, they're actually going to own land, which is an interesting thing for a slave. They, you don't own anything. It's okay. You're going to go to the promised land. And you're going to have that, that inheritance that I have promised back when. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? Norman. Yeah. No other God does talk to his own people and say, this is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to do it because I'm God. Yeah. True. Like, no, none of the Egyptians, you know, the priests of the Egyptians say, well, Ra said, or any other of their gods say, you know, nope, nope, because they're not real. The Lord, He is, He is God. So, Ruth. Yeah. So, He's very personal. I will be your God. You will be my people. Absolutely. Yeah. Anybody else? All right. What strikes me from that passage, it's everything to do with our own salvation. It's just an amazing thing. As I'm looking at it at the study this week, I'm like, wow, that is everything in our salvation. First of all, we see the problem was that of bondage. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, I will bring you out, of, out from under the bondage of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage. So there we see the problem of, well, they're under bondage. They don't have freedom. Um, and in all reality, I was reading this last week about Romans chapter number 6, and that we were servants, slaves to sin, to obey sin in every manner. But now we are different because we are delivered from that. We are now delivered, saved from that of sin itself, so that we don't have to obey it in its lusts anymore. And then not only that, we see the purchasing in the rest of that, verse verse 6, and I, uh, I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. So redeeming with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. It, it rings in my ears here, one redemption, that we are purchased by God. Specifically, it says in 1 Peter that we are bought with a price, not with silver and gold, which are corruptible things, but rather by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He paid for by his own stretched out arms and by the judgments that God gave on, on Christ himself, pouring all of his wrath upon Christ. The judgment was sealed at that moment in time. He became sin. God's wrath was poured on him and he received the judgment that we all deserved. We see that he purchased us, not for us to have freedom and, and do whatever we want, but rather we are his now. He has redeemed us. Not only that, but we see also the being coming people 
the people of God. Notice with me in verse number 7. And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God. And so we, we see here, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. We see that with we are the people of God. And now under the, the dispensation of grace, we are a peculiar people, Titus chapter number 2, that we were reconciled, we were redeemed to be now God's chosen people, not nationally, but spiritually. We are God's organism in the world, the body of Christ, to reach people for Christ. And it's unto good works. And so we are now the people of God. I love what Romans chapter 9, when Israel said no to the gift of Christ, then it says, according to uh, Hosea, that a people that is not my people will come to me. And I will be a God to them, and they shall be my people. And so we, we have this wonderful entrustment of, of we are the people of God. And not only that, but also that of the place that we're going to go to. Verse number, uh, verse number 7, no, verse number 8. And I will bring you in unto the land concerning what, that which I did swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and I will give it you for a heritage. I am the Lord. I always had a problem with one of the songs. Uh, let's see. It's about, about the promised land. I forgot what the name was. Okay, we're marching to Zion. There's it. And so, any thought about, well, we're not marching actually to Jerusalem, so that doesn't really apply to the church. But I'm thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. Promised land, well, what, what's the promised land for Israel? Well, that's the promised land. It's actual land. But for us as the church, God has promised us, Jesus Christ has said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. A promised land being that of heaven itself. We get a better deal out of the whole thing. Instead, Israel has, has land that will be recreated for, for the millennial kingdom, but we have a place that is the new Jerusalem, is heaven itself that he is preparing for us. So we have all these things. All these things remind me of our salvation, how wonderful it is to be saved and to know Christ and to know God personally, that we do have a relationship with God. Just an amazing thing that Israel did not really grasp a hold of because they are back then and we are today. So we, we see this. Um, any, any other thoughts about that, that part? Yes, Norman. Yeah, Israel gets both if they, if they chose wisely. <laughs> so, yes. For the tribulation saints, you know, those who are, in, who are Jewish or Israelites uh, in the tribulation stage, they get both. So, yeah. Yeah, so uh, don't get envious, but <laughs> they have to go through the tribulation in order to do that. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and move on um, to what happens. Okay, God says to Moses, go and speak to my people. So in verse number six, it says, wherefore say unto the children of Israel, and he gives that list. Now let's see their response. Notice with me in verse number nine. And Moses spake so unto the children of Israel, but they hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. Question. Why do you think the people don't listen to Moses? Yes, Billy. Okay, so they have the crushing feeling of, well, their expect, expectations weren't met. Moses came and said, okay, the Lord's here to deliver you. Okay, great, this is wonderful. All right, he's going to go into Pharaoh. He's going to say, they're going to go and we're going to leave. Well, not quite. Pharaoh, let my people go. No, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. In fact, I'm going to make it worse for your people. How dare you say that you're going to go? Nope, that's not going to happen. And so their expectations are rather dashed. You know, if you think that you're going to to get something, if, if for, for instance, if, if somebody said, hey, you're going to go to Disney, and uh, then all of a sudden, oh, 
that's not going to work out. In fact, you're going to have to do you know a lot more schoolwork or a lot more uh, <laughs> a lot more homework in spite of going to Disney. And uh, yeah, that would be dashing the, the the dreams of many of many kids. All right. So what do you think, people? Why don't they listen? Any thoughts, Judah? Okay. Let's let's go back to they won't listen. That's that's. <laughs> That's what what I get from from what you just said. So they don't listen. Yep, they they are not listening. They got other things that they're aware of. They're busy doing. All right, Wanda. It's been a long time. That's for sure. Yeah, those promises have been four hundred and so years uh, waiting. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Every generation would like Jesus to come back right now. Right now. When it's most convenient for us, we want him to come. But when it's not so convenient for us, oh, he, he could stay a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, just thought, thinking about it, well, we're waiting for Christ to come back, and he can come back any point in time that uh, his father says it's go time. And uh, then we'll see him. But yet, not until that point. And so, yeah, it's... Long time of waiting. 2,000 years it's been since Christ left. And we're going to talk about this more uh, for our Sunday morning services. It's going to be for uh, the book of Acts is what we'll be studying in the Sunday morning service. I'm looking forward to that. Any other thoughts? Why don't they listen? Is that a raise the hand tea or? Okay. <laughs> All right. Why don't they listen? Here's another thought. Well, we listened to you the first time, and now things have gotten much worse. We're not listening to you at all. So the thought of, okay, not only did we not get freedom, but things got horribly worse. Double the amount of work, at least, if not triple, the amount of work that you have to do now in order to not get hurt by the taskmasters because you need a certain amount each day. So yeah, made things much worse. Or, another thought is, it's too good to be true. It's just too good to be true. It's like a fairy tale to these people. No, I'm not going to believe it unless he does something dramatic, and he will. But it sounds too good to be true. Very much like salvation. Oh, that mean you mean I don't have to work in order to get to heaven? Well, no, Jesus had done it for you. Well, that sounds too good to be true. What do we got to do in order to, to do it? Well, what do we got to do to earn it? Uh, well, Jesus earned it for us. So we see all of this. Now the question, let's go ahead and turn uh, and, and read the rest of it. Verse number 10. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Go in, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, that he let the people, the children of Israel, go out of his land. And Moses spake before the Lord, saying, Behold, the children of Israel have not hearkened unto me. How then shall Pharaoh hear me, who am of uncircumcised lips? And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, and gave them a charge unto the children of Israel, and unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. So question here, and then actually let's go ahead and look at verse number 30 now. He says, verse number 30, And Moses said before the Lord, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips, and how shall Pharaoh hearken unto me? He kind of falls back into one of his old excuses of that I can't speak well. Or in that I'm not worthy to speak for you. I am not the guy. I'm not the right guy for you. Why do you think he falls back on that excuse? Yes, T. Okay, he said, potentially, he was the cause of the problem. Okay, Judah. Right, so it's a test of faith for Moses knowing, okay, well, 
it didn't work the first time, I'm going to go back and say the same thing. What if it, things get much worse from that point? What if he kills me? What, you know, oh, it's a test of faith. Absolutely. All right. Anybody else? Why do you think Moses falls back into his old excuse? He's traumatized because of the fact of things are just not going well. So first you say, okay, go, and they will listen. Okay, you went, they listened until, okay, Pharaoh made it worse. Pharaoh said no. Well, that didn't work. And then, okay, you said, okay, talk to your people again and say all these wonderful promises. Well, I did that, and they still didn't listen to me. I am not going before Pharaoh, and I'm not really expecting much to happen at that point in time. So, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> definitely traumatizing if things did not work out well for you the first few times you tried it. So, yeah. Yep, so, you know, it's an amazing thing. Um, he's trying to, to try to get out of being the leader, but yeah, God has a a way for him to go and to do. And he is actually, interesting enough, as we go through the different plagues, it's an amazing thing to think about. From this point forward, he doesn't ever go back to God with any excuses. He doesn't go to God to say and, and whine about how unworthy he is. He doesn't go back and say, I can't speak. No, every single time from this point forward, you see all of the different signs, and every single time Moses is there, he says, thus saith the Lord, it happens, and then Pharaoh's the one that crawls to him. Amazing. Every time you see Moses praying from this point in time forward, it's to end one of the plagues. In fact, let's go ahead and look at it. Verse Chapter number 8. And um, let's go ahead and verse number 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. If, and if thou refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all thy borders with frogs. And the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, and shall go up and come into thine house, and into thy bedchamber, and upon thy bed, into the house of thy servants, upon thy people, and into thine ovens, and into thy kneading troughs. And the frogs shall come up both on thee, and upon thy people, and upon all thy servants. Okay, so that is a major plague if you think about your house being covered with frogs. You know, Thinking about my house being covered with frogs right now, that would be a tremendous thing. Laura opens the oven and all these frogs come flying out at her or, or opens the cupboards and all these frogs. and Oh boy, that would be a tremendous day. Right now, we're pretty good. We've only had a few lizards sneak by and decide to, to, to be in our house for a very short period of time because we find it and, praise the Lord, we haven't killed any, I don't think. We set them all free, huh? Yes, Timo. Oh, yeah, we do have a frog, don't we? Yeah, one, one, one day in the morning, Laura comes to me and says, I think we have something in our house. I'm not really sure what it is because we found a, a dropping on, on, the, on the, one of the tables. I'm like, oh, that's weird. And uh, she looked it up. Oh, it's frog. Okay, there is a frog in our house. Well, we looked, and then in, there's, on the t that table... There's a little plant that uh, one of our neighbors gave to Laura for her birthday, and in one, and underneath one of the the leaves there, is this really green frog, with his beady eyes just looking at you, and he hasn't moved since he came into the house, so I'm not really sure if he's still alive, but uh, yeah, it, it's a one interesting thing. We do have a frog in our house as we're talking about that, so yeah, it's it's really odd. Um, who knows, right now he, you know, he's probably, you know, getting something to eat right now or, you know, <laughs> while we're away. <laughs> Guardian frog. All right, there we go. Um, but notice with me what happens after this. Verse number eight. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord 
that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go, that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. And Moses said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me, when shall I entreat for thee and for thy servants and for thy people to destroy the frogs from thee and thy houses, that they may remain in the river only? And he said, Tomorrow, and he said, Be it according to thy word, and thou mayest know that there is none like unto the Lord our God. And the frogs shall depart from thee and from thy houses and from thy servants and from thy people. They shall remain in the river only. And Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh and Moses cried unto the Lord because of the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. So we see that every single time now Moses talks with God, it's specifically in the ten plagues talking about the four plagues that Pharaoh comes to Moses and says, hey, pray to God that all this leaves us. Okay, that's fine. Now, it's a curious thing of Pharaoh, okay, when do you want those frogs gone by? My answer, right now. Right now. Just pray right now that they all die. Um, But tomorrow, why in the world would Pharaoh not kill them off right at that instant, but tomorrow? I'm just kind of curious. Timo? Huh. So, so you think that Pharaoh, just to show he's a god, that he can predict what day it's going to be. Well, that could be. I'm not really sure. I don't really have an answer for that except for, oh, Norman. <laughs> okay. Give God time to accomplish. All right. Judah? Okay, to see whether or not God will do his word when he says he's going to. Yeah, yeah it's always a curious thing. Why tomorrow? Why tomorrow? Why, why not right now? <laughs> God's not strong enough. He won't be able to take care of it right now, but maybe by tomorrow he'll be able to. Yeah, all right. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. But yeah, we have four different plagues. Frogs, flies, fire and hail, and locusts, that each one of them, Pharaoh talks to Moses to go pray and let these plagues be done with. I'm not really sure why those four specifically, um, but yeah, so it's a very interesting thing. What Moses does now is he prays on the behalf, and it's sort of like he knows that he's winning. He knows that the Lord is in control. He knows that that everything's happening according to what, what God has already said. And not only that, he's getting Pharaoh on his knees saying, you have to do this for me. Uh, we can't proceed without these plagues still here. And so, uh, with these plagues still here, we can't function correctly. So you need to do something, Moses. And so it's very interesting to me. But what do we learn about from all this about Moses' prayer life. Any lessons that we can think about? All right, Judah. Okay, so if it seems like we let somebody down, we can have God help us through it. Absolutely. Timo. Yep, trust God. Even if things are not going your way, absolutely. Any other thoughts? Yes, Laura. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it's it's more of okay when things are going wrong, um, is it still God's will? A lot of times, if we take a lot of the popular teachings in Christianity today. And say, well, if things are going wrong, it must be not, it must not be God's will for you to do whatever He's called you to do. Not necessarily. <laughs> you think about the Apostle Paul and all that he had to go through in order to do what God called him to do. You would say he was a miserable failure because he had all this adversity, except for God wanted him to do 
all those different things. And yes, he was whipped. Yes, he was stoned. Yes, he was shipwrecked. Yes, he was all these things. But then you look at Jesus, and he's the ultimate example of, well, he's doing exactly what God wants him to do, and everything isn't just peachy. Everything's not just you know sunshine and rainbows there. Jesus Christ went through a whole lot just from his own people being rejected by them, being rejected by the religious leaders, being rejected by his own family. His own brothers didn't believe on him at that point in time. He was rejected of of the governments. He was rejected by everybody except for those few followers that came and stayed with him until the end. And then he was uh, betrayed. He was murdered and then executed on the cross. And then all of that. Then he felt the wrath of God on him. So yeah, just because things are not going your way doesn't mean that it's not God's will. Yes, Wanda. Yeah. I can't do this. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, God's going to do it, and he's just going to be the mouthpiece. He's, he's just the one to say, I'll say it the Lord. And God's going to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's an amazing thing to think about. And going over back to Exodus chapter 6, and everything that he says to say to the people, I want to count how many eyes we have here, what God's going to do. Wherefore, say unto the people, of the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with, with it, just with a stretched out arm and with great judgments, and I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will bring you in unto the land concerning that the which I did swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob, and I will bring, give you uh, for an heritage, I am the Lord. Eleven times, God says, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Boy, it's an amazing thing to think about. God is so good that he's going to do it. Yes, Ruth. Oh. Yeah, Moses is the central person in this whole narrative, and Aaron's just kind of there. <laughs> It's like, okay, Aaron, say this to him. Okay. <laughs> well, I guess he's talk, talking to him right there to say that to him. And, okay, you're going to be a god to Aaron, and Aaron's going to be uh, the prophet before Pharaoh. And so it's so weird how, how God worked that out. But, yeah. Yep. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the more and more we trust God and, and whatever He has called us to do, and we have specifics in the Scriptures of what we should do, and then there's the, you know, practical day-by-day -day things of, okay, he wants you to do this, guides you to this, that, and the other. Um, and then if we say we can't, well, God can. No matter what, God can. And he can get us through all the hard times as well. If we think, oh, we're, we're following God and these hard things have happened, well, okay, that doesn't mean that we're out of God's will, but rather we just need to be patient, we just need to pray, and seek God's face, and he will make us a way through all of the, the difficulties that we find. All right, great. Anybody else before we get to a prayer request? Paul? Oh, that's an interesting thought. Yeah. So did Moses relay the message to Aaron in Hebrew? Right. He speaks through a translator. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that could be that Moses speaks through Aaron because Moses is speaking Hebrew to Aaron. Aaron then speaks Egyptian to Pharaoh. Yeah, that could be a very big possibility. Yeah. Interesting. All right, good thoughts. All right, let's go ahead and turn our attention to prayer requests.